Before I introduce our guest, I'd like to thank the Council in the Classroom and GeoQuest sponsors. That's the Dennis and Phyllis Washington Foundation, Qatar Foundation International, Allegiance BNSF Railway Foundation, First Security Bank, Humanities Montana, Trail West Bank, and of course, the Max Baucus Institute at the University of Montana. And speaking of Max Baucus, I am very honored to welcome Ambassador Max Baucus. Ambassador Baucus is a former United States Senator and Ambassador to China, active today in business, public policy, and international affairs. In his years as an elected official and diplomat, he was engaged in the most consequential issues of the past half century and continues to provide counsel as co-founder of the Bacchus Group. He's a native of Montana, the state where he was raised in a ranching family, appeared on the ballot nine times and never lost an election. Greetings, Ambassador Bacchus. How are you doing? I could not be better. Good hearing your voice, Chris. Uh, great to hear you too. So let me just hand straight over to you. Go right ahead. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, this is cool. I really like talking to, to Montana students, third, sixth grade, all levels. And um, especially with Mel, both, both of us together, really appreciate this. Um, I forgot worked, to introduce this guy. And also we have another, we have a third person here. This is Sparky. <laughs> Sparky's he's only about four pounds. I mean, he's about three years old and he, loves people and he loves dogs. So we're very happy to introduce Sparky to you. Um, just a couple of things. Um, uh, when I was in the Senate, obviously I've traveled all around our state. Um, uh, when when um, the person, the young lady introduced herself at, at, at Sydney, reminded me of working in the in the beet, beet fields out there one day in the pulp mill. Man, oh God, I could, I, that smell lasted my clothes for a week, but I really, <laughs> it worked. I love working hard at that, that pulp mill. Um, uh, Montana and um, China. Uh, first of all, a little bit about the United States and China. It's, we loved serving over there. Mel and I lived three years in Beijing, the capital city, representing our country, the United States uh, in China. I was the US ambassador at the time. Um, but uh, it's interesting, the size of China is virtually the same as the size of the United States. We're about the same size in geographical area, about the same, there's not much difference. But there is one huge difference and that's population. Um, there, there are four times more people in China than there are in the United States. We have a population, well, I don't know, maybe 330 million, something like that. But in China, the total population is, is, is close to 1.4 billion. So it's, it's four times uh, the population of, of, of the United States. So what that means is it's very crowded. You go to cities in, in Eastern China, most of the big cities are in Eastern China, uh, next to the Pacific Ocean. It's very crowded. It's you just feel it. It's much more, much more crowded than Montana is by far. Um, one thing that's interesting to China is a lot like the United States in the sense that uh, northern China can get very, very cold in the winter. We were Mel and I were up at something called an ice festival mm -hmm. up in northern China. Man, it was cold. I mean, it's, it's cool. There are all these different sculptures. They, people there spend months carving stone out of the ice river and making these big palaces um they're cold you gotta get all dressed up you gotta be all your, all your fur coats on but it was fun it's right next to siberia and in fact in the town where we visited they have a refuge for siberian tigers but we didn't we didn't go there yeah no we were, we we're too busy to do that but then you go to southern china and it's a, a little bit like southern u.s it's there are palm trees um it's humid um, it's it's moderate. It's it's just very very. It's like U.S. that way. There's one part of China, the far west, in the mountains are reminded me a lot of Montana uh, because there are a lot of snow-capped peaks there. I thought, gee, it's arid. Not a lot of people. Um, it's just it's in very high mountains and, and snow-capped peaks, just like we have in our state. Uh, but it is arid. So one time I was out there, I, I got in a camel. They say, Max, you want to ride a camel? I said, sure, I'd like to ride a camel. <laughs> so I, they put me on a camel. I, we walked around <laughs> in, the, on the, in the desert. So it'd be a bit like Eastern Montana, but 
much more sand um, mm -hmm. out there in Western China than there is in Eastern Montana. And when we were in the South of China, it's a, a province called Yunnan and it's rainforest and tropical and there are elephants. And we went to the refuge for elephants that were being saved from poachers and it's right next to Cambodia and Laos. So they have great big boa constrictors there. Yeah, and they're, and they're trying to protect the environment. It's, it's, it's really quite impressive. <clears throat> um, China developed very, very rapidly and quickly, maybe 15, 20, 30 years ago, and it gave no attention to the environment. Rivers very polluted, mm -hmm. air very polluted. I mean, really bad. I mean, really bad. And um, but they knew it was a problem, and they started working on it. Mm -hmm. And so over time, now that the rivers are, are much less polluted, they're still pretty polluted. Um, but and air um, less polluted too. I remember I was standing next to the mayor of Shanghai, big city there on the eastern coast, next to the Pacific Ocean. Just beautiful, huge, big buildings, fancy buildings, and so forth. He says, "Boy, this is really impressive." And he looked at me and he said, "Oh, but we've got problems." He said, "This river is so polluted. I hope to have it cleaned up in ten years. I don't know if they ever did or not, but it's it's there. there it's very the results of of, of that massive growth are of cost and a lot of that is pollution. But they're working on it." Do you want us to pause for questions now? Or I was just going to, that's great, Mel. I was just going to say, let's do a round of questions from our students, um, really focusing on that geography of China. And you can ask very specific questions or you can ask about um, Ambassador Bacchus and his wife's experience. Um, and we can do this one of two ways. If you're more comfortable typing in, go ahead and type it in the chat. If you would like to ask the question to us using um, video and your microphone, we're excited for you to do that too. Um, it looks to me like Mrs. Barnowski's class is ready to go with a question. Would you like to start us off? We sure can, we'll let Alex go. What kind of food do they eat in China? Well, that's a great question. I was gonna get into that. Um, you know, it's very interesting. You know, here at home, you know, we go to a Chinese restaurant and you got, chow mein, lo mein, and, and, and all that. Well, that's, that's not really what the food in China is. There's some of that. But in China, it's, it's a huge variety of food. I mean, people love uh, the, the, all different kinds of vegetables and rice and noodles, pork. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a huge variety. Um, and, and, it's, and noodles probably is, is the mainstay uh, and rice. Noodles a little bit more in northern China, and rice a little bit more in southern China. Don't forget dumplings. And oh, I was going to get the dumplings. Um, they, uh, one of our very favorites um, is dumplings, um, and Mel Mel knows how to make dumplings. We brought that recipe back home from us. We've had dumplings about almost once a week. But they're they're like little raviolis, and uh, they're wrapped up, and you can either fry them like pot stickers, or you can steam them. But China consumes more pork per person than any other place in the world. So pork, yeah. chicken, beef was kind of, they yeah. don't take American beef. But I want to ask you a question. What's the weirdest thing you ate in China? Yeah, well, I like to eat all kinds of foods. Mel, <laughs> Mel's tastes are a little bit more particular yeah. than mine. I'll eat anything. But, uh, <clears throat> um, oh, eyeballs. Um, fish eyeballs. Fish eyeballs. Um, for one, <laughs> I, I, it's interesting. That's why I like eating them. Um, then there's another food there, which they're, they're kind of proud of. It's called stink, stinky tofu. <laughs> now, is you know a lot of people like tofu. I'm okay with tofu, <laughs> but um, they have something in the middle of China that's very proud of stinky tofu. <laughs> and man, when they serve it, guess what? It stinks. really stinks. <laughs> it's terrible. I did not eat no, that. No, Melon. But when you eat it, it's good. Well, I, would, I just got to get past smelling it. You, then you can eat it. Um, so <laughs> the reason Max ate fish eyeballs is because um, it's traditional, especially in northern China. They they they'll bring maybe twelve or fifteen different courses, and they put them all on the lazy susan. And it starts with cold uh, things, maybe walnuts, mushrooms, stuff like that. And then you get to the hot dishes and they always have a chicken dish, a fish dish, and the fish is usually the whole fish. 
And so when Max would be the guest of honor, it's tradition that after everybody has part of the fish, they bring the head and the tail of the fish to the guest of honor. And thank goodness it was him and not me. Yeah, so and, they brought so they brought this great head, big head of a fish, big fish, and and a tail, it. big fish, and they're right there in front of me. So what am I supposed to do? Well, I'm supposed to eat it. <laughs> I'm, I'm the guest of honor. And so I did. It was tasty. I got to admit, I liked it. I like delicacies. It was good. Um, I'm going to talk about the weirdest thing I think I ate. What, Mongolia? In Mongolia, yeah. we, we, China's right next to Mongolia, and there's part of China that's inner Mongolia, and then there's Mongolia. And we went for their annual festival, and we were both the guest of honor in a tent, a yurt, uh, if one of their government officials, a great, a great big guy, man, he was, he weighed about 300 pounds, big and guy, they, all dressed up in a local garb. They served boiled goat and the goat's head was right on top. And we had to be the first to eat the ribs, but then you had to drink fermented mayor's milk, which was absolutely disgusting, but we had to drink it and pretend like we were enjoying it. Even I did not like that. I did not like the first well. It was pretty bad. But it's kind of interesting, though. You sit there, um, suddenly so the, the big chiefs, not the main guy, but his lieutenants, they come walking in. And they and they bring in, um, they pull something out of their pocket. Um, out of their pocket, and it can smell it. And it was a, it was a, it was a snuff box. And, and they'd give it to the chief. And each new lieutenant would come up and he'd have his own snuff box, snuff smell, and he'd give it to the chief. And it, uh, we learned it's a hierarchy, the hierarchy of smells. It's kind of like dogs sniffing each other, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a, you kind of learn who the, this lieutenant is by the smell of his snuff. And, uh, but it was, it was, it, it's all, and they gave it to me. Well, the chief gave me a box. I asked myself, asked myself, <laughs> What am I supposed to do with this thing? So I smelled it. I couldn't smell it. So, so I passed it back. Anyway, it's it's really interesting. That's incredible. Oh my goodness. So I have one request. I'm wondering, Mel, if at some point you remember, would you share your dumpling recipe with with us? And I'll send it to the schools and we can send that out to everybody. That would be so much fun. Hey, um, hey, Greg, Alex, I see. Alex, yep. yeah. Yeah, hey, I just want to let all let the teachers know you guys are working on the challenge. Chris uh, from World Affairs Council is putting some great links in the chat box for you as the ambassador brings up some of these topics that uh, may help you get creative with some of your answers as you work through the challenge. So uh, you might want to take a look at some of those. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll grab those and we'll save those and send those to everybody yeah. after the call as well. I do want to get to some of our other classes just for questions. Um, sure. So we don't we don't forget them. I'm wondering if we could go to Granite High School for a question. Eberg. You guys can turn your video back on Granite High School. That'd be great. Sounds good. So we had a couple of students um, beforehand that um, wrote down some questions. So the first one I'm just going to go with is Davis. He's a junior in the room and he asked, um, how much does China trade benefit the USA and particularly Montana? That's a great uh, There's a lot of trade um, between our two countries. I think it's, it's, it's the largest in the world, the two-way trade. It's about five hundred to fifty billion dollars a year two-way trade between U.S. and China. However, uh, we buy a lot more from China than does China buy from the U.S. Um, Americans like Chinese products. I mean, they tend to be, now be more electronic products. For example, your, your iPhone that was assembled um, in China, mm -hmm. um, and, and a lot of semiconductors are, are, are made in Taiwan, but but some in China. Uh, the big benefit in, for Montana is agriculture. Uh, when I was over there, <laughs> man, I get banged on them all now. You got to take more American beef. You got to take more American beef, more American beef. And finally, by the time I left, uh, they started to buy American beef. So we export a lot of beef um, uh, to China. And that, that's that's the main export. We have a lot of grain too, um, wheat, uh, barley, and once. <laughs> I brought a Chinese official to Montana. This is before I was ambassador, touting our wheat. 
he didn't care about wheat. He wanted to know about our barley. They, they like to drink beer over there. <laughs> and, um, mm -hmm. and so they, I, I don't know now how much barley we shipped to China, China but and dollar value, the biggest one is, is beef right now. Excellent. Thank you so much. Yeah. Let's go to Mrs. Oberweiser's class. And then after that, we'll go to Mr. Kimsey's class. They're thinking about it. They're coming up to the microphone. <laughs> One thing I'd like to, to mention while we're waiting is a big similarity uh, between China and Montana in one sense. And that's the, the very significant indigenous or native mm -hmm. populations. Um, there are probably 50 different indigenous tribes um, in China, all over the country. We tend to forget about it, and they, they're all very proud uh, and dress up mm -hmm. in their local costumes. It's, it's, it's wonderful um, in different parts of, a, of the country. Now, there are a lot of Muslims in China, too, which care about their tradition, their culture, a lot of Hindus, which care about theirs. But I, um, the, the, the tribes, the, the indigenous cultures are, are, are very important. And a lot of that's in southern China. In fact, mm -hmm. we, we visited one, uh, they call them Mia? Meow. Meow. They call them Meow, like a cat. <laughs> meow. Mm -hmm. And man, they're all dressed up. And even Governor Steve Bullock was there for, the, for that one. And he'll, he'll have a story to tell you about that. And you could have sworn you were at a powwow in on a reservation in Montana with the traditional uh, singing, the dancing, right. the colorful yeah. costumes and headpieces. Yeah. It was kind of remarkable. One thing they do, <laughs> the meows, which is kind of interesting. Once, once you kind of get going, some of the meow women all dressed up. This is a, a tradition. They come over to you. The guest of honor. The guest of honor. They step on your toes and they pull your earlobes down. <laughs> and you're supposed to down uh, and, gu and, and guzzle a drink while they're also singing and screaming. <laughs> it's, it's pretty intense. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. And it's disrespectful if you don't. If you don't, well, you got to do it. Yeah. You got to do it. So anyway, what's the question? <laughs> <laughs> do you guys get a lot of snow in China? Yes, we do. Yes. Well, Although, not in Beijing. Oh, 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 yeah. You know, sometimes. You know, sometimes. It, it depends where you are in China. It where you are in China. It's a huge country. So northern China gets a lot Lots. of snow. Um, southern China, no, no. Uh, Beijing, kind of the middle. It's Beijing where it's a little bit like Washington, D.C., our nation's capital. And so right now it's about the same temperature there as it is in Washington, D.C. If we get a little snow, but it doesn't last just a little bit, not very much. Right. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Kinsey's class, do you have a question for Ambassador? We do. Here you go. Um, does the China social credit system affect you? Like, do you have your a social credit score or get rated by that? Well, that's a good question. Um, China does, as your question implies, have a, a quite intensive surveillance system. Um, there are cameras everywhere. Um, they tap your phone when they want to. Um, your your um your, your mobile your, 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 that is your um, social media is 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 tapped. Um, there's no question about it. And they moved into, as you suggested, a social credit system. That is, um, you get points, you get deductions if you do something bad. Like say you're caught jaywalking or you're caught doing something you know, marginally bad, you get some debits, you get, and that's part of your social credit system. So that if, say, if you want to travel overseas, or if you want to travel between two cities if you got too many debits too many demerits under the social credit system you know you may they say no no you can't buy that ticket you can't buy that ticket from beijing to shanghai now that was for the chinese we as americans were not part of that at all but when we lived over there we were totally surveilled 
I, I knew that almost all the time, anything I said um, was potentially recorded yep. by, by the government. Even in our home. Even in our home, in the residence, everything. Now, um, we could go some places where we knew our conversations were secure. We had to really work at it. Mm -hmm. But after a while, frankly, I didn't care if, if what I said was surveilled. I got nothing to hide. And, and frankly, um, I think it's good for them to hear us, like Mel and me, we talk, and we're, we're ordinary people. We're talking about ordinary stuff. We're talking about cooking. We're talking about the meal. We're talking about our kids and all that. And sometimes, <laughs> sometimes we're a little mischievous. Uh, sometimes we engage in a little bit of disinformation. Sometimes we'd say in our, while we're sitting in our, our at, at dinner, have just two of us together, oh, gee, isn't China wonderful? Isn't President <laughs> Xi Jinping the most impressive person in the whole wide world? <laughs> now, we wouldn't do much of that, but it was just, it was, well, we got a little mischievous. Wow, that's pretty interesting to think about having a social credit score and how that might work um, and impact your life. I'm wondering um, if you could talk a little bit about some of the good news and some of the things coming out of China that are really positive. A lot of times we end up hearing and focusing on negative things that are happening in the world. And so one of the one of the things that our Montana students are doing as part of their GeoQuest is learning about the good stories that are coming out of countries and then taking those and relating those to Montana and telling the world about the good stories that are coming out of our Montana communities as well. So if you wouldn't mind taking a moment to talk about that and then we'll go for another round of questions. Sure, um, when we were there, um, <clears throat> This is not a local level, but a larger level. I was very heartened that President Xi Jinping of China very much wanted to work with the United States to address global warming. They really cared. They, mm -hmm. They're cutting down their coal-fired power plants. They're looking very aggressively for renewable technologies, solar, wind, et cetera. In fact, they spend more on solar and wind than we do in the United States. They spend more on renewables than we do in the United States. To be fair, that's from such a big country. Um, it's, it's a large, it's a proportionally a lower percentage than, uh, than it might appear to be. Um, and, but, and, then, and then they're still there. They're still part of the Paris uh, of, of police talks, uh, Paris Accord. And they're going, and they, they've just released a pretty aggressive plan on how they're cutting back carbon emissions, released it just a few days ago. So they, they, they're really trying because they know that they're part of the world. They know they got to work with all countries, even though the United States form of government is quite a bit different from theirs. We're in this world together. Climate change affects the whole world. So they know that. Um, second, they're, 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 they're commercially uh, motivated. So they see this as a way to develop um, um, renewable technologies, which they can sell. Um, I, they're very opportunistic that way. They're always looking for an opportunity to, to, to get an advantage. Now, the main advantage they want is, um, is for their people, uh, the living standards, the people, address air and water pollution. That's what they really care about. I mean, people are the same the world over. Americans and Chinese are the same. By that I mean this: we both care about we both want to have decent incomes. American families, Chinese families, both want to have food on the table. Both take care of our kids. We want to have good opportunity for our kids, education for our kids. In both countries, in both countries, we want to address air and water pollution, decent health care, have an opportunity to do something we want, be left alone a little bit. I mean, it just we're we're the same. And I am very impressed with how China cares a lot about that. Now, we have our differences, um, but that's because our cultures are so different. Our, we're so far apart. From, you know, the Pacific Ocean separates it, us into different sides of the world. But um, it's, it's, I was very impressed. I found Chinese people very optimistic, upbeat, mm -hmm. very optimistic and upbeat. Um, can I add some good news? Sure. Uh, the, in spite of what we hear politically now and all the China bashing that's going on and 
the, the conflicts that you hear about on the news, Chinese people, uh, they love the United States. They love what the constantly be asking me about, you know, oh, what's it like? What it must be wonderful. They all know what Yellowstone Park is. Um, and love it. They, they can wear it is American, it's Western. They, they just can't get enough of it. And it's really every Chinese parent's dream to have their child educated Very in the old. United States because they have such high regard for it. What was the difference in visas? Oh, yeah. We have, um, the United States uh, uh, gives about 300,000 uh, student visas <clears throat> to Chinese students that come to study in the United States. And I, mean, I worked once at the desk there interviewing kids coming to get the visa and so forth. And the, these little girls, they, boy, they want to come. <laughs> and they're asked, who's paying for your trip? She, one little girl, she basically says, well, my, my parents are paying for my trip. That's fine. <laughs> but they, they're about 300,000. Unfortunately, very few American students go to China. It's about 25,000 maybe a year, compared with 300,000 Chinese that come to the U.S. They care very, the Chinese people like the U.S. They like Americans, they like free speech, they like open spaces, mm -hmm. they like our democracy. Now they can't, they know that's not gonna change much in China, but they like what they know about the United States, most of it. However, I'll say this, once I was talking to a bunch of, um, uh, uh, college aid students in, um, in mid China about coming to the United States. They're going to the University of Missouri, I think. Um, and but all the questions they asked, unfortunately, were about their safety because they see on TV um, gun violence. Right. They see people getting shot, and so they cared a lot about their safety. They want to come to the United States, but they're worried about you know lockdown obviously their, their safety but so they watch the united states even though there's this firewall they they, they, they the educated chinese in the middle class chinese they, they can pretty much can find a way to to learn what's going on in the united states when we got there everybody in china was watching house of cards yeah they love asked, house of cards and asked <laughs> If it was true, and I yeah. said, "Well, Max hasn't murdered anybody that I'm aware of." <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so they they love American culture, American food, yeah, American clothes, American, you know, Western, Western, especially generally, generally Western. So but it's changing a little bit, but they still like America. So we do another question. Sure. That's. Let me just interject a little bit, Mel. Thanks for bringing that to light because. For the kids that are working on the challenge and and just for all of us in general, it's really nice to hear both of you talk about that side of China. And when we're looking and focusing on good things that are happening in China, as opposed to what we hear in the news all the time, it's nice to hear firsthand that that maybe all the things we hear in the news and the mainstream media news is not as accurate as it really is over there. So thanks for interjecting those good things. Can I add one more thing? Absolutely. Max, Max and I encouraged all American students, if you get the opportunity, you've got to see China and experience it to appreciate it. And that's how we work out our differences. It's a lot harder to hate somebody that you've been friends with, yeah, that you've right. shared culture with. Yeah. And uh, if any of you ever had the inkling, do it. And I, I might say to you, uh, Greg, you're absolutely right. What you read in the papers, I mean, it's all top line stuff. It does kind of get people all stirred up, mm -hmm. but that really is not what's going on from the Chinese perspective. That's really not. And it's unfortunate, but it's, it, it, Mel, 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 Mel mentioned it. People don't know because not because very few Americans actually go to China. Yeah. Um, I live there, smell it, breathe it, understand it. Allie, you no, know, just one more quick thought, yeah. Allie. You know, all of our experiences with video conferencing for the last 15 years, what we found, and it was really interesting to hear them say, they like America, and there's a lot of similarities. And that's what we always find when we're video conferencing. To all the students out there, if you guys get a chance to video conference with anybody internationally, you're going to find out that the kids are kids and people are people, and we all have all these things in common. So thanks. Go ahead, sure. Allie. 
Absolutely. I was just going sure. to say, as you're working through some of these challenges and thinking about good news coming out of your community, think about what you would like the Chinese people maybe to know about Phillipsburg, Montana or Drummond, Montana. Um, I think that's a very interesting way to think about and to frame um, just the thoughts that you're having around the GeoQuest. So let's go ahead and open it up to some questions again. Um, I'm looking at Granite High School and I see that they've got some folks right there. I'm wondering if you would kick us off with these questions. You're, you're muted, Granite. You got to unmute. <laughs> um, what would the U.S. <laughs> what would the U.S. gain from a conflict with China and the issue with Taiwan? What could they lose? I'm sorry. The question is: Is Taiwan? Yeah. Yeah. And the conflict. And the conflict. And what what can what can we gain and what can we lose in terms of this conflict? Well, I'll just cut to the quick here. Um, I think it's important for both countries to express their positions with respect to Taiwan, but do it in a, in a, as much as possible in a civil way, um, not in a histrionic way. Um, it's very clear to me when I was serving over there, that Taiwan is a core issue uh, for China. By core, that means it's non-negotiable. The other core issues are basically Tibet, Hong Kong, um, maybe Xinjiang province in the West, but it's, it's bit, Tibet, Hong Kong, and Taiwan are core. For the Chinese, you just, I'm sorry, you don't, we don't negotiate, they're ours. And if you, you, you in any way try to take any away from us, that's, 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 that's serious. If they're non-negotiable, and Taiwan is one. And as you know, um, Taiwan was once Chinese, um, and it's it is mainland Chinese. And during the Civil War in China, uh, in the 30s and 40s, essentially, um, the nationalists got beat by the communists in mainland China, so the nationalists went over to Taiwan. And so the China says, well, that's, our, that, that's ours, Taiwan's ours. And they believe that strongly. Now, Taiwan has become very wealthy. They, they're democratic. Um, most Taiwanese don't want to be part of China. Some do, but most don't. And there's a big lobby in the United States in favor of Taiwan. And the lobby is using Taiwan as a sort of a, as leverage against China. Um, the U.S. policy toward uh, Taiwan and China but on the Taiwan issue is called <clears throat> strategic ambiguity. Now, that's a big fancy word, but I, th I think that it's pretty helpful. That is, we, each side knows its position with respect to Taiwan, but we should just be careful and not do anything that's going to ignite a war. Um, talk about it. The issue will be resolved over time, maybe not in our lifetimes, it may take a long time. When President Nixon was over in China to talk to, to the, um, I guess, I was, who, uh, Joe and I first about Taiwan, the Chinese recommendation was, well, let's just put Taiwan off on a shelf. We'll deal with that later. That's not a big issue right now. And that's kind of how it is being dealt with now. My personal view is we're, we're uh, cranking up the rhetoric against Taiwan too much because the more we crank it up, the more it causes China to react negatively. Um, and they're gonna crank up. For example, I saw in the news today that um, because that it's been revealed that the US, US has some you know, troops in Taiwan, that is military personnel uh, training um, a Taiwanese army, that China said, oh, now they're going to uh, increase the number of Chinese troops you know, on the border of eastern China next to Taiwan. I mean, it just it doesn't help to ratchet this stuff up. Uh, it's, much, it's, much, it's much wiser, I think, to, okay, let's cool it. We each have has his point of view. 
Let's be civil about it. Let's not attack each other verbally. Um, but, but let's be, it's, 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 it's an issue and we have to handle it very carefully. I think there's one other historical fact that's really important. Um, so as you know, was it 1972, Nixon went to China and that's when Kissinger had been making secret trips over there, negotiating how we could have diplomatic relations again. And at that time, we had a diplomatic presence in Taiwan, but part of the deal was to restore diplomatic relations with China, we had to excuse ourselves from Taiwan and more or less endorse a one China policy. Well, that's what it is today. You know, the, the Biden administration has uh, continued with what's called the one China policy with respect to Taiwan. That is, it's, it's one China. That's our policy. Now, each side interprets that differently, but it still is one China. Whatever you can def define it any way you want, but it's one China policy. We've kept that for oh, 40 years. I want to, that's incredibly inf interesting information. And I know that Chris has put some great information um, on a talk between US and China tensions and to US, Thai China and Taiwan tensions, excuse me. Um, and I bet we could spend hours going down into that a deep, deep, deep conversation about that. But I want to make sure that we have time for three other classes to ask some questions. So I'm going to go ahead and move over to Mrs. Oberweiser's class. Um, are you ready for the next question? Yep, here they come. <laughs> Excellent. And then after Mrs. Oberweiser's, I am going to go to Mr. Kimsey's and then to Mrs. Barnowski's class. So you can be prepared. Plants. Yeah. Uh, what kind of plants do you guys grow in China? You know what, can you speak up a little bit and you're breaking it. Uh, what kind of plants do they grow in China? Um, um, oh, oh, good question. Many kinds, um, I'll make it into that a little bit differently. When Mao Zedong, Took over the Communist Party. Took over during the Cultural Revolution. All birds were killed. There are no birds. Why? Well, the birds were eating the grain. They needed the grain to feed the people. So there are no birds. Now there are a few birds that have come back, but not a lot. Not a lot. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> Northern China is experiencing. Uh, encroachment of the desert um, into the mainland, and it's, it's 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 getting pretty severe. Partly caused by global warming, by climate change. So the Chinese have tried to plant a lot of trees out there, um, but it's not working. The trees just don't take. It just, it's it's a problem. It's dry. It's, just, it's so dry. It's so dry. It's, it's desert. It just it's so dry. Um, southern China uh, plants are very similar to what you expect to see in southern United States. They have big, you know, palm trees, big leafy bananas, bananas, um, all that. Because it's humid, it's mm -hmm. hot and humid in, in southern China. It's, um, but it's and and grains mm -hmm. and, and and all, all uh, lots of vegetables. Mm -hmm. um, you drive on the, when you're on the train. High-speed train. If you ever get a chance to go to China, by all means, you got to be on. Take their high-speed train. They go 880 miles an hour. I mean, it's zoom and just totally efficient. When you zip by all these farmland of, of beets and beans and carrots and celery mm -hmm. and tons of vegetables, because there's they eat a lot of vegetables. Um, probably their diet is more vegetables. Mm -hmm. Uh, than American diet is. Uh, Mel mentioned pork. They love pork. You can eat a lot of pork and chicken, but a lot of pork and noodles. Each almost each province thinks it's got the best noodles. See, and and they're different and they're good. 
Um, uh, but you need flour for that. But you need flour. You need flour, you know, for the noodles. So it's um it's it's mixed, um, but much more. And a lot of it is, is irrigated in central China, less so in southern China. They they're also developing vineyards. Um, they think they're going to have a big wine industry mm -hmm. in about four or five, six years. But it's really interesting. They're growing the vines. I mean, the stocks are put underground in the winter because otherwise they get frozen. Then they pull the stalks out um, in the spring and each year they get a little bit bigger. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a, they're very innovative, very innovative. Um, that's pretty uh, amazing to think about. They, they like, yeah, and they like making money. Um, the, the main, the, the main, um, what I say is um, uh, loyalty in China is, is to family. It's not so much to to um, to a company. It's not so much to a city. It's not so much to anything. It's family. It's your mother, your father, your grandparents, because you they. they the parents want their kids to be the smartest, best educated in the world, so they advance and do better than they. And parents spend a lot of time making sure their kids get by far the best education possible, and it's and sometimes it's ruthless. I mean, it's it's just it, it pressing the kids so hard to study so much. Mm. All right, I want to go ahead and head over to Mr. Kimsey's class, and then after that, we'll go to Mrs. Barnowski's class. All right, so I would like to know, in, after spending a long time as the ambassador, if, is there any major differences between the way we conduct business over here versus having a business meeting in China? Uh, yes. <clears throat> um, um, a, a China, uh, well, it's an authoritarian state, virtually no free press virtually no rule of law. Um, they do have a constitution, but it doesn't mean much. Um, but, but, but culture and family and relationships are really key and critical. Contrast that with the United States. The United States, because we have a constitution, rule of law, a judicial system, and free press, um, businessmen in the United States depend more on the contract that's written, the agreement that's made. It can be upheld um, in the courts. Um, and the, 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 the contract relationship is much less on a personal basis. It's much more on a formal contractual basis. In China, it's, it's very different. In China, it's much more on a personal basis. It's who you know and how well you know that person. And that takes time. It really comes down to trust. Trust in the person because you know the person so well. In the US, it comes down to trust because you trust the legal system. You know the contract can be <clears throat> upheld. Now let's go back to China. Let's say you have a contract in China and the other person is not honoring the contract. So you say, well, you're not, look at section two here. You're not doing what section two says. And that guy says, well, that's, I'm, yes, I am. No, you're not. So what do you do? Well, you go out and you have a few by Joe, you have a few drinks, and you start talking about it. And after a while, two or three times out, you kind of have an understanding. It's a personal understanding of, of what section two says or what, how, what to do about it. Now that's changing a little bit in China. Um, relationships still extremely important, but because China is entering the world more. China has to abide more by international rules um, and, and, and international business practices, especially Western rules and Western business practices. But still, China is China. And so if a, a businessman, American businessman, wants to business in China, he or she has to spend a lot of time in China, a lot of time, get to know people, get to understand them. Uh, China is not one country. China is many countries and many different personal tastes, different 
officials in different parts of the country. There are 31 provinces. So you gotta, you gotta know how to do business in China by living there and being there. 80% of life has shown up anywhere. So it's, it's, there is that difference. Uh, my experience was their business meetings were a little bit more formal. Nobody, it, it, every single business meeting is you start and you are served green tea. Uh, which meant that I had to carry around a little thing of Splenda in my purse because green tea is pretty tart. Um, and we're in the United States, you get coffee. In China, the meetings are a little more scripted and a little less candid at first, just at as first. at first. As Max said, you you really have to build the relationship. Yeah, it takes time. It takes time. And it, it's, it still very much depends upon it. trust which depends on the relationship. That's pretty interesting. Um, right before we go to Mrs. Barnowski's class, I read an article um, this past week and it was highlighting how there's businesses in China that are a thousand years old, 2000 years old that are family businesses. And it was talking about that tradition being handed down. And you think about that compared to, I know, um, Ambassador Bacchus, you're a four, am I correct in saying fourth generation um, ranch family from Montana. Yeah. Well, I, I, I would, haven't done the math, but we'd have to look at the math as to what a thousand year old business might look like, <laughs> how many generations that would go back. So that's a pretty interesting thing to compare. Also, with, uh, they're, very, they're very proud of their history. Yes. And in some respect, they think civilization began in China. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, thousands of years you know, before, before Christ. I mean, it's, They've been there forever, the Middle Kingdom. I mean, all kinds of iterations, but they think, to a large degree, they think, hey, we're it. Mm -hmm. This is where civilization began. There are artifacts in the Museum of China, which is in Beijing. And if you ever get there, that is like mandatory on the list. Uh, but they have artifacts that have been carbon dated back 8,000 years. So. The one thing the Chinese believe is that they've been around longer than everybody and they have the patience to wait out. Patience is a big Chinese virtue. Very patient, just wait, just wait. Um, can I, uh, one of the things that we did over there, we went to see the, um, the grave of Confucius, um, which is 72 generations back. Yeah, 72. And, it, one of the people that worked for us at the residence was his last name was Kong, which is the Confucian family name. And he was very proud of the fact that he was the 72nd generation of Confucius. That's and, really impressive. <laughs> and you go to the burial site, you go to Confucius, where Confucius was born. Super creepy. It's, well, there's <laughs> all these mounds, burial mounds of different generations buried it's it's they're big mounds like burial mounds like uh, native american mounds in some parts of the united states it, it's just it's very interesting because the family adds to the mound every year in honor of the deceased all right uh, now i know uh, a national hall Oh, I'm sorry, we're almost out of time. I'm seeing that Mrs. Oberweiser's class has to go and I wanna to get to Mrs. Barnowski's class for their last question before we run out of time. So I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Mrs. Barnowski's class. You guys have livestock in China? They asked about livestock. and What type of livestock they have in China? Um. Um, not a lot uh, compared to what you might expect. Um, there, there's herds of cattle. They're not mm -hmm. large. They're not large. Lots and lots of, of, of farmers, ranchers have small herds, uh, quite small. Mm -hmm. um, sheep too, quite small. And these be local farmers, not too far from Beijing, out in the mountains. They've got a small herd. Uh, but not a lot, not much, and they're they're not they don't make a lot of money. Uh, now there are big hog farms, but it's more mm -hmm. processed hog farms, and and chicken the same thing. Um, but um, and horses, you see a few horses, mm -hmm. especially in uh, inner Mongolia. A lot, oh yeah, a lot of horses. If you go to northern China, Mongolia, 
That's a horse culture. It is. It's just horses everywhere. But and, they're, they're little horses. They're well, not yeah. very big. Yeah. I mean, we saw a race in Mongolia. And these kids, they, they, how old are they? 13, 14. 13, bareback. Uh, how long was the race? 15 miles. 15 miles. As fast as you could go and, bareback. And you go 15 miles out to the start, then turn around and then, then you race back. Mm -hmm. I mean, horse, it's a Mongolia, Eastern Mongolia, Mongolia, Northern uh, Mon Mongolia is a horse culture. Also in Tibet, which we were fortunate enough to go see and might have been one of my favorite places. Everybody has a yak yeah, yeah. and every house has a yak uh, and they save the yak dung and that's what they use for uh, fire in the- yeah, yeah, everything's yak, yak dung, and make, yeah, make, yak, yak skins make the tents, yak make butter, everything's yak. There yak, you got a lot of oil. yaks, yak oil. We, we ate yak yogurt, who knew that was good? And I got to tell you, I got kind of sick of yak after a while, but there's a lot of yak. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Well, this has been an amazing hour and I want to thank you so much for sharing your experience. And I've learned an absolute ton and I know that our students have as well. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Chris from the Montana World Affairs Council just to say a few words before we go. That was absolutely amazing. Thank you so much, Ambassador Melody and Sparky for connecting uh, Montana with China in, in such a really personal way as well. And, and in a way that makes us think, you know, okay, there are some differences and that's interesting, but there's a lot of similarities and, and, and you know, bringing those home to all of us here in Montana, well, it's, it's just a wonderful thing. So we thank you for that. And special thanks again to our friends at Inspired Classroom who help us bring these amazing events to classrooms across Montana. And uh, a special thanks to our very generous sponsors. That's it for today's event. Ali, anything else to wrap up? I got to tell you, there are cats in China and there are cats in the United States. We brought back two cats from China. Um, too bad they're not with us right now. Two, one's called Baby uh, Jing Jing. They're wonderful cats. <laughs> I love it. That's wonderful. And I love that note to end on. Um, we've recorded this and I will send out the recording to all of the teachers and the ones that were not able to make it today as well. Um, I'll also send you a link to this recording, um, Ambassador. And I hope that you guys all have a fantastic rest of your day. Thank you so much for connecting. Thank you for all that you're doing. This is really important. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> Bye, everybody.